What's up, skeptics? Thomas Westbrook here. This last month, I had Dr. Bart Ehrman, who's a New Testament scholar and New York Times bestselling author, on my channel to talk about the historicity of Jesus, whether or not Jesus actually existed. And we got a lot of pushback from mythicists who claim that there was no historical Jesus. And I wanted to have him come back on to address some of these comments and give his feedback and responses. Obviously, we don't have time to answer all of them, so this isn't a comprehensive video, but we'll get to as many as we can with the time that I had. He also has gone into this stuff a lot more in detail in his books, which I'll link to below if you want to check them out. And he's doing a webinar on the Christmas story and how much of that is likely complete legend and fabrication and which parts are more likely to be historical based off of textual analysis. I'll put a link to that below. It is an affiliate link, so I get a small commission if you want to go sign up for that. I'll also be watching it as well. And I think it's gonna be really, really interesting. It's like a full day, like I think it's like a three part webinar. In the meantime, I really hope you enjoy this video. Unfortunately, it's not super edited or anything because I got in a motorcycle accident and my shoulder got dislocated on my dominant hand. But um, yeah, here's the unedited clip and I hope you like it. Dr. Ehrman, after we did our last interview, we got a lot of blowback from the mythicists in my audience. And so I wanted to take a little bit of time to address some of their concerns, some of their questions, and some of the pushback and statements that they said, and okay. see what your take is on them. So okay. first of all, we, we got a lot of positive feedback. We got a lot of people who enjoyed the, the seminar. But there was also, I mean, we always get picked apart for every little thing. There were some people who loved the fact that you were jovial and cheerful, and other people thought that the fact that you were laughing made it seem like you didn't take mythicism seriously. <laughs> That's right. just the nature of the game. Right. But the first thing I want to touch on is, I got a comment that says, I have no problem accepting that there were a bunch of itinerant Jewish rabbis wandering around the Holy Land 2,000 years ago, or that many of them were ap apocalyptic preachers looking to expand their various death cults, or that the story of Jesus is an amalgamation of stories based on these men. I have a huge problem with the idea that any of them were divine. Is that what you're arguing? No. <laughs> I don't think Jesus is divine. No. No, of course not. No. I'm a Look, I'm a historian. I, um, I'm, I'm not a Christian. Um, if I believed Jesus was divine, I'd be, I'd be a Christian. I, I'm not a Christian. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm skeptical of much of the Bible. Um, I think that a good deal of the historical narratives in both the Old Testament and the New Testament are not historical. They're not historical information. Mm -hmm. um, and this, this seminar I'm doing is gonna be talking specifically about the birth. Uh, you know, what can we say historically about it and what appears to be legendary? Most of it is legendary. Uh, and so I have no, no problem with that. But that's a very different calculus from saying that there never was a man Jesus. I do not think that he was an amalgam of a group of, of people. Um, we don't have good information about these groups of people. What we do have good information of is a single man, Jesus. And we have numerous sources that talk about it, uh, talk about him, that are independent sources of one another. And so the point I made in my webinar is the same I'll just always make, and people don't people don't want to hear it. But the quite you know, if you're looking for historical documentation of a figure from first century, you have very few people in history who are documented the way Jesus was. And so you can disbelieve it if you want, but uh, it, you know, I don't know what kind of historical evidence you would hope for, <laughs> other than what we've got because it's a lot. I mean, again, I'm not a believer in Jesus, but I'm just telling you the evidence is a lot. Hmm. Well. You have Josephus mentioning multiple Jesuses, and I, I brought this up in our, my last um, interview with you. And your your question was, okay, well, which which Jesus would be one that they're pulling from and 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 creating this amalgamation from? But isn't there also a mention of a different Jesus in Philo of Alexandria when he one of my commenters talks about a Jewish angelology that's written by Philo in which Jesus was first born of a god and God's high priest. Are there other figures like that that they could be pulling elements from? I've also heard a take that Jesus is um, influenced by Greek mythology and they're taking stories from these influences from the surrounding cultures. Yeah, yeah. no, that's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. But that, the thing in Philo, if somebody said that, tell them to send me, send me a note and tell me what reference they're talking about in Philo. Okay. Uh, well, so, no, there are lots of Jesuses in um, Josephus, but you know what? There were a lot of Jesuses who played uh, 
played uh, shortstop and second base when I was a kid in the 1960s. I mean, there are a lot of Jesuses out there playing shortstop. And so it's a common name. It just means Joshua. So it doesn't mean anything. That there are lots of people with this name. Um, these other Jesuses that, that, um, that are talked about by Josephus are not Messiah figures. And they're, they're you know, there, there is one that has similar predictions of Jesus and that he, he predicts that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed, Jesus of Ananias. But Jesus of Ananias was, was living decades after we started getting stories about Jesus of Nazareth. And so it's not it just. Yeah. So um, what you well, can. But I, I want to push I want to push back on that, because wasn't he the, the one who was like killed with a, a catapult or something during the siege of Jerusalem? Or am I mistaken? No, that's right. In the year 70. So, so if if he if if that's the Jesus that has some parallels with the Jesus in the Gospels, and many of the gospel, like for example, uh, John wasn't written until around the year ninety after the fall of Jerusalem. Couldn't that have been pulling elements from that character, that you know, sort of messianic figure? Jesus is talked about by Paul in the fifties. But for the later writings, if they're taking well, stories of these other John, messianic figures. Okay. The reason it doesn't work is because John precisely does not have that message that Jesus of Ananias preached. The earlier gospels do. And that message is found in the sources behind those gospels. It's found, for mm -hmm. example, in the Q source and the M sources and the L sources. And it's found in Mark. Uh, Mark might have been written somewhat a little bit after 70. But he wasn't living in Palestine, and the North, stories of Jesus of Ananias are found nowhere. So there's no way, if suppose Mark was writing in Rome, as many people think. There's no way stories of Jesus of Ananias had reached Rome because nobody was even talking about Jesus of Ananias. So, I mean, why would anybody think that a story mentioned by one source, Josephus, about something that happened in the year 70 is influencing gospel traditions that are earlier than that? So, so it's it's like a timing discrepancy. Well, that's what history is. Yeah, I mean, history is about timing. If you have an if you have an anachronism, you know, it's just you know, you you're not going to say that whoever invented the microwave invented the person who influenced the person who invented the convention oven. It, it doesn't make any sense, and so of course it didn't happen. Trump didn't influence George Washington. So what? And so. Uh, so, so chronology is pretty important. Your earlier question, though, was about Greek mythology. And this is where it really is important, because in Greek and Roman myth mythology, you certainly have stories about divine men who are sometimes born of a union of a mortal uh, woman with a divine being who uh, can do miracles, who uh, are taken up to heaven when they die. And these stories, I think, almost certainly influenced the uh, storytellers who are telling stories about Jesus. And so the big task for serious historians is to figure out when you have stories about Jesus, how many, what parts of these stories actually have some kind of historical merit and which parts are legendary accretions based on the kinds of things people would say about someone like this. And so that's, that's the historical task, but it isn't done by simply kind of, you know, picking stuff you like and don't like and throwing it out or keeping it in. It's, I, I, have, I have very serious friends who have spent 30 or 40 years working on just this problem, who know Greek and Hebrew and Latin and Aramaic. I mean, like, they, they, and so, you know, it isn't just like, oh, yeah, it's like Jesus. <laughs> it's like it doesn't work that way. <laughs> So if, if you have a figure, for example, you know, most scholars, the, the general consensus is that Moses very likely was a mythical figure. And obviously characters like Zeus are seen as, as mythic. But why is that taken with kind of, uh, there's there's no pushback against that. But when it comes to Jesus, all of a sudden there's like, like how would we, th this question specifically says, Setting aside the patent absurdity of the story, you know, the miraculous accounts and what have you, how do you distinguish between a mythic personification and an actual person? The real this question should be, is the consensus of a real person based on a full spectrum of fair consideration, or are there natural biases with certain ancient figures? Why do we assume Zeus is mythic no, and not look, Jesus? A, look, I have no bias about Jesus. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a Christian. I don't believe he's the son of God. What, what kind of... But the question is asking, why would I think Jesus existed, but Zeus did not? What are what are the the, the different methods that were used? Zeus is 
what? I don't even understand the question. I mean, Zeus, Zeus is a god. <laughs> He's not a human. Well, so is Jesus. No, Jesus is a human. I don't believe that Jesus was God. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the man, Jesus. The He's kernel that it's based on. I'm sorry. Look, if you want to do history, you need to learn how historical method is done. You can't say that because Zeus didn't exist, then maybe Jesus didn't exist. That's like saying, I mean, what is it like saying? It's like, I mean, it's, it. I'm sorry, that isn't a serious conversation. Hmm. <laughs> really? You well, mean, if, 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 if Bilbo Baggins didn't exist, then therefore Abraham Lincoln probably didn't exist? Well, I don't get it. Hmm. Bilbo Baggins isn't documented as a historical figure. Pa the Apostle Paul knew Jesus' brother. How many people knew Ze Zeus's brother? <laughs> and you're wrong, by the way, to say that Moses, is, there's no question about Moses. There are lots of historians who think there was a Moses figure, uh, and they have some evidence for it. So it isn't just that you kind of blow it off because you think it's weird. You have to look at the evidence. And if you aren't willing to look at evidence, you can say anything you want. But if you look at evidence, you're in a completely different ball game now. Yeah, and I, I'm I'm going to keep twisting your buttons a little bit just because I'm I'm I've got more of these comments to throw at you to get your <laughs> feedback. <laughs> so, Jesus, really? here here's another one. Of course, Jesus never existed. Even Paul never puts him here on Earth, but in a spiritual realm. Oh yeah, what does Paul do that exactly? And then he he mentions. Where does Paul do that? I, I'm, I don't know. I'm just reading the comment. Yeah, I know. Exactly. People say this. Like, Paul has Jesus being crucified in heaven. Okay? Show me what verse that one's in. Paul says he was born of a woman. He says he was born a Jew. He says that he that he had a brother named James. I mean, he, Paul, Paul talks about things that Jesus said. He talked about what he said at the Last Supper. Mm -hmm. Paul... Paul knew Jesus' brother, James, and Paul knew his closest disciple, Peter. Look, the only way to write these things off is simply to have a, a, an agenda where you are certain that there couldn't be a Jesus and because you've got a reason for thinking that. There's nobody who would go into this open-minded who would just look at the evidence and would, it would even occur to them. And I'm not talking about Christians. I don't know any historians who take this seriously. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, yeah, I've got, well, and, I've got like, hundreds and hundreds of colleagues in history. Department. They aren't Christians. Mm -hmm. They just know how to do history. So why is it that mythicists make fun of us for doing history and think that, you know, well, don't you realize that Jesus was crucified in heaven? What, what, where are you getting that from? Besides somebody else who told you that. Yeah. And it's well, something you want to know. You, you want to believe it, so you believe it. Well, okay, I don't think there's a moon landing. Yeah. Well, one, one of the pushbacks that I got in a comment was, you know, well, just because Paul says he's born of a woman doesn't mean he was, but that's not the argument being made. It's saying that argument. Paul saying that Jesus was born of a woman is proof that Paul is not arguing that Jesus is up in this yeah. heavenly realm exclusively. Yeah. No. I mean, it's a weird thing to say he was born of yeah. a woman, but he has reasons to say it. But, you know, it's not, <laughs> uh, yeah. you know, I, I know, mythicists get really upset that New Testament scholars don't take them seriously. I know that. Mm -hmm. But you need to come up with better arguments. Well, here's one that might be a little bit of a better argument, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> uh, reading the sources, there were the Docetists, and he, he has second John in parentheses, who were a sect of Christians who did not believe that Jesus came in the flesh, but came in spirit only. It was a very early Christian dispute, and Dr. Ehrman did not address it, not to mention all of the Greco-Roman influences into Christianity. I think that that's pushback to the, the claim you said no one in ancient times claimed Jesus didn't exist. And well, this the is a claim, Jesus existed. But this is a claim that there was no fleshly Jesus, that it's this... Uh, no, no, Purely this is spirit. completely misunderstanding docetism. Okay. And if you don't think I know about docetism, I've written extensively about docetism. 
so if they want to, if they want to know something about docetism, read my book on the Orthodox corruption of Scripture, because I I actually I, learned about docetism through uh, misquoting Jesus. Your book, yeah, but, but they have misunderstanding if they think that that this indicates that Jesus was not a, a not a being on Earth. What they think is what the docet. So first of all, Second John does not mention docetism. So I'm not sure what what they're i guess they're refer, there's a yeah there is a pass there's a passage in first john and there's a kind of a brief reference to it in, in second john but they're not called docetists and we don't know about docetists per se until the second century um but these are kind of forerunners of docetism these people do not deny that there is a man jesus docetists do not deny there's a man jesus what they think is that the person who was the man jesus was in fact a divine being who, uh, who did not have real flesh and blood, but he was still a person on earth who spoke, who, uh, who did things, who did miracles, who was active with his disciples. They did not think he was a myth. Quite the opposite. They thought they definitely did not think he was a myth. And so you can't use the docetist. <laughs> so what, why would I mention those? I mean, it's not that I don't know about docetism. <laughs> I think I can, I can give you a pretty good history of docetism. <laughs> okay. Um, can I ask you one more question? Sure. <laughs> you said that there was, that that it's possible that Luke was copying from Matthew rather than having a, a separate source or that Matthew's copying from Luke, but you said that there's very, very good reasons to think that that's not happening. Yeah. What are those reasons? Okay, it's complicated. So um, Matthew and Luke, um, um, and Mark, the three of them have many stories in common that are sometimes word for word the same. And so somebody's copying somebody. And there are pretty good reasons for thinking that Matthew and Luke both used Mark that are, it would take me five minutes to explain the reasons, but they're, they're so convincing that since the 19th century, just about everybody who's tried to study this thing has said, yeah, that's probably right. Matthew and Luke also have a, a number of sayings of Jesus that they have in common that are not found in Mark. So they had some source for that, but it's not Mark. Uh, and so the question is, did Luke copy Matthew? Did Matthew copy Luke? Or did they both copy a different source? So the argument, I'm not sure I can do this very quickly, effectively, but I talk about this in a number of my books. When Matthew and Luke have these materials that are not found in Mark, they are almost always in a different sequence in their gospels. So the Lord's Prayer will be here in, in Matthew and it'll be down here in Luke. It, the Beatitudes will be here in Luke and it'll be up here in Matthew. And like, so they're in different sequences. But the stories from Mark are almost always in the same sequence. What that suggests is that if Matthew had copied Mark and that Luke had copied Matthew, he copied Matthew, then it means that whenever Luke was copying Matthew, he had a copy of Mark on his lap and a copy of Matthew on his lap. And whenever he ever crossed the story in Matthew, he'd look up to see if it's in Mark. If it's in Mark, then he'd keep the order. If he saw it's not, he'd read through all of Mark to see it's not there, then he would change the order. I was like, what? <laughs> Nobody writes a book like that. <laughs> and so, so it's more likely that they both have some other source of sayings They've got Mark, they copy Mark. They don't know what the sequence of sayings are. They're just like sayings. And so they plug them in at different places. And so that's the argument. It's the argument of sequence. Fantastic. If I had more time, I, I would love to get into the um, reliability of the mention from Tacitus, Josephus, and Suetonius. I know you've gone into all of those in detail yeah, yeah. in your book, Did Jesus Exist? Yeah. I'll put a link to that below. Um, that that's a huge point that a lot of mythicists push back on and that I got in my comments. It's not lost on either of us, but unfortunately we're out of time for today. I do very much look forward to um, attending your webinar and I'll put a link to that below as well. I strongly encourage you guys to go check it out, to look at how textual criticism can be applied to figure out which elements and nuggets of a story are more likely to be true or not. We're not saying blatantly 100% this is all factual. We're, it, history is probability. Probably. Dr. Ehrman, thank you so much for your time. Okay. It's, it's been Excellent. an honor. Well, I enjoyed it. <laughs> Thanks. Hopefully I didn't push your buttons too much. Oh, no, no, I enjoy this kind of thing. It's just yeah. like, I got really Zeus and Jesus. <laughs> really? I'm, I'm trying desperately not to straw man the positions, but there's varying levels of credibility to different arguments versus others. And there's people who want me to address more of Richard Carrier well, no, stuff. Yeah, there's I know. But I mean, you know, some of the... I, you know, I, I was at, you know, I did this debate with Robert um, and 
um, and we we had this meeting with these mythicists. They had a cocktail party. I just couldn't believe how I mean they just didn't know factual information about the past. I mean about just, history, methodology, or both. The New Testament. They knew nothing about the New Testament. Nothing. Okay. Nothing. And yet they wanted to trash it. It's like, well, I don't mind you trashing, but you should know something about it. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't like it when creationists trash science. They don't know anything about science. Why don't you learn some science before you trash it? <laughs> so, you know, mythicists who trash the historical record, I just find it really upsetting because if we start trashing the historical record when there's this much evidence, what stops us from trashing it in other ways about current events? You know, how do we how do we establish what happened if we're not willing to look at evidence? And if we don't look at evidence, I mean, get rid of the Holocaust. Get rid of January 6th. I mean, get rid of all sorts of shit because, you know, well, evidence doesn't matter anymore. Well, if it matters, then you need to study it. 